How would we take someone who was happy, fulfilled, and at peace and turn them into a miserable, anxious husk? Stoicism is perhaps the most popular school of philosophy in the world today. All across the internet, there are thousands of online gurus giving their interpretations of the great Stoic thinkers. If we follow their teachings, Stoic philosophers promise that we will be more resilient, more virtuous, and above all, happier. But what if we wanted to do the opposite? What if we wanted to use the teachings of Stoicism to rob any semblance of happiness from our lives, leaving us an empty shell of our former selves? It's certainly a challenge, but one I undertake willingly in this video. Get ready to learn the ultimate mindset for misery, how to make yourself a social pariah, and much, much more. But without further ado, let's get started. 1. Ignorance is not bliss a pillar of Stoic thought is that their philosophy is supremely rational. According to many of them, Stoicism simply follows from a proper acknowledgement of how the world is. If we're going to make our lives as miserable as possible, it's important that we understand this worldview so that we can ignore and reject it. According to the Stoics, the world has two significant categories. Things that are inside our direct control and things that are outside our direct control. The first category contains our thoughts and actions, whereas the second one contains literally everything else in the world. Anything from the actions of our best friends to the weather is placed firmly in the box of stuff we can't directly change. Epictetus thought that this was perhaps the most important distinction in Stoicism, and that almost everything else was entailed by this simple recognition. He said that once we realise we can't control anything apart from our thoughts and our actions, then we could focus entirely on those and become much more relaxed about the rest of the world. After all, any external change we can bring about only happens through our behaviour, so it makes sense that our efforts would be concentrated here. So, if we want to destroy our lives, then the path we must take is actually rather simple. We ought to expend our mental energy only on things that are outside of our control. We must contort our minds and torture ourselves over things that we know we cannot change. We should devote an awful lot of time to regretting the past, since we definitely can't affect that. And when we do dwell in the present, we ought to stress about everything that is beyond us. We should think about all the different ways our life could suddenly fall apart. Perhaps there'll be a financial crisis in two weeks, or another pandemic, or a nuclear war. We should never miss the opportunity to stoke our anxieties about events totally beyond our power. On the flip side, when it comes to our thoughts and actions, we should do the exact opposite. The last thing we want to do is take responsibility for our decisions. Otherwise, we might get the idea that our lives could improve and start accumulating dangerous granules of hope. Such things could eventually form a lifeline to pull us out of our miserable state. And we can't have that. So we must make sure that we never give a moment's thought to our own mind and our own behaviour. We must pin everything on other people. Our fingers should become tired from singling out the world or our parents or God as the author of our suffering. Rather than even entertain the thought that the first step to a better life might lie with ourselves. Reflection should be the enemy and blame shall be the name of the game. Even better, we should get the two stoic categories confused entirely. We should trick ourselves into thinking that if we just tried hard enough, then we could change the behaviour of other people. Likewise, we should start believing that our minds are entirely out of our hands. We must think that we have no capacity to control our desires and act on every passing whim that flits through our consciousness. We could take this one step further and believe that other people have total control over our emotional state. How could we possibly be happy we will cry out into the night when you've seen how badly they treat me? And this should be easy enough. After all, it's a lot less work than trying to change our own behaviour or slowly alter our thoughts through self-reflection and endless, dizzying practice. It is a worldview that requires we do nothing at all. It reassures us that we are at the mercy of outside forces, a leaf blowing through a hurricane with no power to alter its course. In such a situation, there is nothing to do except panic about which direction the wind will take us next. And the wonderful thing is, the anti-Stoic worldview does in some ways really reflect reality. Our lives are deeply affected by numerous factors outside of our immediate control. But we should go one step further and tell ourselves that this truly is all the universe consists of, and that ultimately our own thoughts and actions are insignificant to our long-term well-being. Then we can complain about all the things we can't change, rather than focus on the one thing we can. And it goes without saying that we should on no account follow the Stoic advice. If we concentrated on the factors within our control, we might begin to slowly chip away at our despair. And this is hardly conducive to our goal. For our purposes, it is much better to shout at the sky to stop raining, rather than to get an umbrella. 
But of course, this alone will not seal our fate. There is still plenty that the Stoics can teach us about cultivating misery. We still might accidentally stumble across information that could improve our lives. Luckily, our next point will tell us just how to react to this. If you want to help me make more videos like this, then consider subscribing to either my email list or my Patreon. The links are in the description. 2. Thoughtless action and actionless thought the Stoic thinker Seneca used to say that the key to a good life was twofold. First, you need to know what the right thing to do is. And then, and this is crucial, you need to do it. Epictetus used to admonish many of the most educated men in the Roman Empire because despite the fact they had access to almost unlimited knowledge, they never bothered to apply it. And so it was like they'd never learnt it at all. They may as well have spent all that time at the pub, at least then they'd have had a laugh. For the Stoics, philosophy was not something you merely learnt, but something that you practised constantly. So, if we are to properly guard our sadness, we need to make sure that we do one of two things. Act without thinking, or think without acting. The first of these two paths is the easiest, and as a result, the one that I recommend. This involves just giving in to whatever our basest impulses tell us to do. If they tell us we should cheat on our partner, or hit someone that insulted us, or spend every day blackout drunk watching reruns of children's television, then we should do it. At no point should we give a moment's thought to the long-term consequences of our actions. For that matter, why should we even care about the short-term ones? Instead of trying to reconcile a dispute with a friend, why not just never talk to them again? Instead of reflecting on what might fulfill us over the course of our whole lives, let's consider only the next second. If you are halfway through a project and the urge to persevere has left you, then by all means, just give up. Miss deadlines, ignore your loved ones, and spend your days in a stupor of drinking and hangovers. Whatever can dull the mind, we should take to with gusto. After all, thinking might lead to reflection, and reflection is the enemy of despair. If we truly commit to this, then we should end up in prison before long. Maybe we lost our temper and punched someone. Maybe we stole a TV. Maybe we drove drunk through the streets of London with our todger pressed up against the window. Whatever it is, we are sure to have thrown our lives away. And once we continue these patterns of behaviour in prison, we will guarantee there is no hope for our rehabilitation. Of course, if we're more intellectually inclined, we can take the latter path and think without ever acting. We will become an arch-theoretician, the kind of person who knows what they should do to make themselves happier, but never gets up and does it. We will recognise that we should go to bed, but we will torment ourselves with sleep deprivation. We will know that it will cheer up our mood to go for a walk, so we will stubbornly refuse to do so. And we shall brew in our own sadness instead. We will acknowledge that our relationship is making us unhappy, but we will stick around anyway, too passive to act out what we know is best for us. We will become more book than man and spit out a thousand philosophies without ever leaving our armchair. Perhaps this is even more unpleasant than the person who acts without thinking, since the idle thinker is someone who knows what they must do but never musters up the strength to do it. They will end each day admonishing themselves for their errors, only to fall into the exact same trap the minute they wake up. For me, this embodies my own flaws perfectly, and I'm sure it will for some of you watching as well. The ultimate thing we want to avoid is considered action. If we act, we want it to be without a thought. And if we think, we want to keep that as far away from our behaviour as possible. Often, deliberated action is the first step to slowly making our lives better. So we cannot allow this insidious hope to infect our minds. Act only on impulse and then sit around considering your mistakes afterwards, with the express knowledge that you will never learn from them. That is the true path to despair, and it has been well trod. But once we have made sure that we never think before we act and we never act on our thoughts, where do we go to intensify our pain? Well, this is where we learn to embrace our worst instincts, each one a nail in the coffin of our joy. 3. Vices Galore The Stoics used to spend an awful lot of time cultivating their four virtues – courage, wisdom, temperance and justice. Someone like Marcus Aurelius was said to have organised much of his life around these principles, and Cicero reported that they were a cornerstone of the Stoic way of life. So, if we are to be the anti-Stoic, we need to devalue these as much as humanly possible. Let's take the first one, courage. Well, this seems easy enough. We should just become cowardly. This is the natural state of a human being when they're scared anyway. We encounter things that terrify us, and we run away. A 
stoic would ask us to hold our ground in the face of adversity, to stick up for ourselves and our values, but we should not listen to them. We need to immediately give in. If something is difficult or scary, if it involves putting our neck out for what we believe in or to protect our loved ones, we must instead sprint in the opposite direction. This will guarantee we'll live the rest of our lives without an ounce of self-respect because we refuse to stand up for what really matters to us. Next is wisdom. The Stoics divided wisdom into a number of different subcategories, but they all had one thing in common, learning from those who know more than us. So we must reject this idea wholeheartedly. If someone is more informed than you about something, then pretend they aren't. Never own up to your mistakes or acknowledge that you might have more to learn about a topic. If you are lucky enough to have knowledgeable and experienced people amongst your friends and family, distance yourself from them immediately. Don't bother with the so-called wisest people in history. After all, our situations are too unique for someone else to possibly have any insight into them. We must reject any attempts to learn from those who have been in our shoes. We must instead decry them as arrogant or stupid or both for not recognizing our special brilliance. Many of us have a natural inclination towards intellectual overconfidence anyway. This will just allow us to indulge in it. Next, on to temperance. The Stoics broadly thought of temperance as the ability to control our desires. So they would advise us not to let our happiness depend on excess, but instead to remind ourselves how little we need to truly be fulfilled. If we have some food to stave off hunger, some water to stave off thirst, and a roof over our heads, we should broadly consider ourselves lucky. Beyond this, they would want us to keep our material needs limited. We could work to accumulate more worldly goods. In fact, many Stoics did this. But we should remind ourselves that we can be content without them. So, to reject this advice, we simply need to spin our own hedonic treadmill until it's almost off its hinges. We should imagine that contentment is on the other side of wealth or achievement or endless sex. We should let desire rule our lives and watch as its gaping maw consumes everything in its path all while its unconquerable stomach growls for more. Finally, we have justice. The stoic concept of justice is quite complicated, but it can broadly be boiled down to treating people honestly and considering how you would like to be treated in their place. Of course, the opposite of this is just avaricious self-interest. We all know people who are willing to screw over others to get ahead. We just need to follow their example. If you want something from someone, just lie or bully them until they give it to you. If you can't get what you want by being straightforward, then manipulate those around you until they feel emotionally compelled to give in to your heartless demands. Watch the hate form on people's faces as they realize you've played them and shoot them a smug smile just to hammer home the message that they've been duped. Tell yourself this is all a hallmark of your supreme intelligence and superiority, that in fact those people deserve to get tricked. Then sit back and observe how people leave you, how they besmirch your name until no one will even talk to you anymore, how the bonds of love between your partner, your friends and your family are permanently shattered, and how you've been left alone, surrounded by the memories of those who once gave you their trust. I can't imagine a more efficient way to destroy everything that makes our lives worth living. But the fun is not over yet. Now that we've ruined our lives, we need to make sure that they stay that way. And this is where our next step comes into play. 4. Attach to everything. My childhood dog is named Rosie, and she's lovely and adorable and the best thing you'll ever meet. But her biggest distress in life is when my mum leaves to go to the shops. She will cry by the door waiting for her return. I think she's under the impression that my mother will never come back, and it sends her into a panicking spiral. She is a cocker spaniel, so she can't reason out that normally my mum is only gone for 10 to 15 minutes. All she feels is a threat to the attachment she has to my mother. And so she will stress until her triumphant return. The Stoics would probably admonish my dog. They would tell her to recognize that my mum is outside of her control. And little Rosie would do better to appreciate her in presence, but not get so attached that she mourns her absence. They would remind her of all the children of Marcus Aurelius who died when they were very young, and how he coped with the loss by reminding himself that these infants were never his to hold on to. It was not his right to snatch them from the jaws of death and treat them as if they were gods. It was this that allowed him to let go and retrieve again some meaning for his life. Of course, my dog can't do this, it can't have these conceptually complex thoughts, but we can. 
which is why it is imperative that we do the exact opposite. We should behave like my dog with everything and get attached to as much as humanly possible. Whenever we gain a friend or a lover or even a mere material possession, we should immediately think that we cannot live without them and place them at the foundation of our happiness. We should catastrophize about what would happen if we no longer had them. If our partner left us, we would surely never find another. And if our friends moved away, we would lose all possible connections with other people. Above all, we must think that in order to be happy, everything must remain as it is now, forever. Since change is perhaps the only inevitability in the world, this will ensure that we are constantly disappointed and panicking. At any given moment, it will feel like our life is collapsing around us, because from our perspective, it is. Everything we value will be continuously running away from us, and this will tear us apart inside. And there is no reason why we should limit our attachments to what is actually the case. We can become attached to possibilities, too. We can envision one sole direction for our life to take. And if it looks unlikely to materialize, we can immediately conclude that existence is no longer worth it. We must never accept that things can go wrong. And instead, we should believe that life really ought to be easy. That way, when we encounter a challenge, we won't see it as something to rise to, but rather a divine injustice that can never be overcome. If we keep this up, then we won't have much to do at all, apart from complain that life is unfair. We should imagine we have some cosmic deal with the universe, that it owes us many, many things. We can indulge ourselves in thinking that we are a misunderstood genius or have a hidden talent that the world just doesn't appreciate. After some dedicated practice, we would begin to think that we are simultaneously the greatest and most victimized person in the world, and that no one could truly understand our suffering. At this point, we will perceive ourselves as metaphysically screwed. Another great thing about all these attachments is they'll pull us in so many different directions we won't know what to do. We will simultaneously be obsessed with becoming wealthy and maintaining our lifestyle and crave the attention of our preferred sex. Simultaneously be attached to the image of ourselves as a great thinker and a great artist and a great sportsman. In all likelihood, all of these competing urges will amount to us doing nothing at all. We will be paralyzed by indecision, and that will be the headsman's axe. It will put us in such a state of bewilderment that we'll lose sight of what we even want out of life. We'll be obsessed with getting everything, and in the end, we'll end up with nothing. In Kierkegaard's terminology, we will become so captured by the notion of possibility that we will forget actuality entirely. And it goes without saying that the blame for this worldview will always lay at someone else's feet. But, my dear sufferer, we are not done yet. There are still small glimmers of hope for us. So it is vital that once we are in the pit of despair, we close the door. Luckily, this is our final point. 5. Repression and Indulgence Despite what you may have been told, the Stoics were not great fans of emotional repression. Sure, they thought that we should be resilient, and they modelled that in their lives, but they had a very particular picture as to how this was achieved. In their view, every time a person becomes upset or enraged, we have a choice. We can fully indulge the emotion and give in to whatever behaviours it wants us to perform. We could ignore it and pretend that it doesn't exist, or we can examine the feeling to see why it has arisen and how to move forward. They held that in between something happening out in the world and our emotional reactions, we can intervene using our rational judgment. We need to understand our feelings before we can alleviate our pain. If we don't do this, then either the emotion will consume us or we will try and bury it deep, hoping that it never re-emerges. Both roots leave only misery in their wake. First, we could indulge our feelings, essentially surrendering our minds to the sway of our emotions. So when we are upset, we let that colour our entire view of the world. We let it tell us there are no positives in life, and we allow its grey filter to rob reality of any vibrance or vitality. Of course, we can do this with any of our passions. We can let temporary moments of joy spill into the fantasy that we'll never be unhappy again, heightening our disappointment when the troubles of life inevitably reassert themselves. We can ensure that one bad day makes us angry for weeks and that we never forgive anyone that's wronged us. This is, in my opinion, probably the easiest route to despair, and we all know people at various stages along this path. The flip side of this is just to completely ignore our emotions or treat them as something deeply shameful. Rather than view ourselves as a creature with both emotional and rational components, we should deny that we can feel anything at all. In the UK, we're very good at this. We call it British repression. In this state, we would never bother to deal with our sadness or anger or fear. Instead, we would let it build up 
inside. We won't be able to understand it or address it because we will never even acknowledge its existence. We can keep up this approach for many years, letting ourselves grow number and number until one day we snap. Our mind breaks in two, and decades of feelings rip through our chest like shotgun blasts. Then we will become soulless husks of our former selves, without the emotional skills needed to put ourselves back together again. And the great thing about both of these approaches is that they prevent us from knowing the cause of our misery, and so also stop us from doing anything about it. In the first case, we just resign ourselves to our emotions, treating them like eldritch beasts that bat our poor minds back and forth for fun. In the second case, we pretend that our emotions don't exist at all, in the hope that this will insulate us from their effects. But then our negative feelings will become termites, slowly nibbling away at the supports of our psyche until the whole structure collapses in a single second. Under no circumstances should we ask ourselves honestly why we feel a certain way. We should never inquire into the causes of our emotions, and we certainly should not calmly and patiently analyze how something has made us upset. Once we understand our feelings, we might even be able to change them, either by attempting to change our physical circumstances or by altering our attitude to reality. That is, either by changing the world or our judgment of it. Above all, we should reject the notion that we could slowly master our feelings by knowing ourselves, because this could be the first second of a more fulfilling life. And we certainly wouldn't want that, would we? If you want more of these anti-guides, then check out this video where I explore one of Nietzsche's cautionary tales. And stick around for more on thinking to improve your life.